Now, let me invite uh, our panelists for our first panel discussion, co-solutioning for the panel, uh, for the planet, I beg your pardon, sustainability and uh, sustainable change in hard-to-abate sectors. Uh, I'd like to welcome Apur Andershon, the head of the Secretariat uh, Leadership Group for Industry Transition, or Lead IT. Shilpa Sachdev Bhullar, uh, the head of Legal Risk and Compliance at PI Industries. Raine Isakson, a uh, docent and associate professor, Uppsala University. Class uh, Colberry, CTO, Sam Vision. Jakub Kiefer, the former global head of government relations and public affairs with ABB, and now an executive board member with Spaudi. And Hokan Sundelin, there he is, uh, regional director of Nordics at Electrion. And uh, I'm also uh, very w uh, happy to welcome Bjorn Samuelsson, uh, working on a hydrogen project. He's a lecturer with Uppsala University. So welcome, gentlemen. We'll try and keep this short and sweet, uh, but with a lot of punch, of course. And I'm going to begin by asking you all uh, one common question. Uh, very quickly, if you had to make an elevator pitch, uh, could you bring us speed with one challenge, one opportunity uh, that you see in your sector and the innovation you're working on or the ecosystem that you are creating? So perhaps we can start with you, Per. One single innovation, the one... Or the ecosystem that you're creating with Lead IT, yeah. So Lead IT is 18 members... And uh, you can use the mics here, please, now, gentlemen. So the leadership group for industry transition is 18 member states, uh, member states all over the world in each uh, continent, 18 member companies. We have uh, most of our companies in steel and cement, uh, either in the production side or the transport sector that, that needs and the construction sector needs those. those uh, we see uh, the UN asked in 2019, the climate summit, India and Sweden to set up this group. So this is only four years ago. Should I speak this one? Perhaps but a lot of a things soft, yeah. have happened since. Um, I think also the terminology has changed. I, I noticed that you're, you're, you're uh, using the hard to bait word. So before, 2000, before 2019, it was probably this sector of steel and cement and the heavy industry was probably the, the impossible sector to, to decarbonize. Now, and it, it, for a few years, it has been the hard to abate sector. When we move into the next climate summit in September, the terminology has changed. So now we will use heavy emitters. So it has went from the impossible to the hard but possible to no excuses. So, All right. Uh, I, I, uh, so yeah, there's there's just a little hint for you to maybe per come closer to the closer. mic if you can. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. So the elevated pitch will be that I think we can do a lot together. As uh, Lord of the Rings have told us, if you do things in coalition, you can uh, encounter a lot. So uh, we we work in public private <coughs> partnerships on the on the global scale, and we think this field is changing very quickly. Uh, the policy regulatory framework is changing. It's changing in the EU, it's changing in the US, it's changing in India. Uh, the emerging markets are, are now really looking into what is the price of carbon and how could we make a business model out of it. There are loads of challenges here. We know that 50% uh, 50% of technologies needed for doing what we have to do to 2050 to reach net zero, 50% of those technologies are not at best at the demonstration phase today. So the level of investments are enormous. That it means that the high risk investments, so how do we better pool D and D risk together? Mm -hmm. I think that's the key, to share risks and rewards. That's the function. So to share risks and rewards and, uh, well, setting up a, um, a, or trying an innovation has its own risks. And perhaps we can bring you in here, Klaus. Uh, are, are these ones working? Yeah, they're working. You just need to bend it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So I am one of the founders of a startup company called Sambition. And uh, we are developing uh, 
climate or fossil free cement. And we have now produced the first bunch of it in, a, in our pilot kiln of uh, one ton per day cement. And uh, the technology is that we don't use virgin limestone. We use recycled waste from steel, alumina, power plants like slags and fly ashes, etc. Um, and then we boil it again. And it's not the traditional Portland cement. That is 99% of the global cement. It's another cement with much less uh, calcium content in it. Uh, and it, uh, it has really a huge potential. Mm -hmm. And we really believe and hope that carbon capture and storage, which is the main story for the traditional Portland cement uh, industry, will, uh, will fly. I personally, I've lived more than five years in Africa, and, and I believe that that is a technology that maybe can happen in Northern Europe in, in some areas where we have storage capacity, etc. Uh, but there is another way that for the whole industry, cement industry, we have to look for alternatives to Portland cement, and we have found one of them. Great to hear that. And from uh, cement, maybe we can move on to another innovation. I'm going to uh, bring in Hoken here. If you can come close to that mic, perhaps, Hoken. And uh, very quickly, uh, in a minute, tell us about your innovation. We'll bring in Bjorn after that, uh, about the hydrogen project he's working on, and then get in the other stakeholders. Okay. Thank you for having me. So, uh, uh, Electron is providing uh, wireless charging uh, for vehicles, uh, all types of vehicles and in all types of uh, operation, meaning standing still or on the move. Uh, as some of you experienced uh, yesterday, we are having a demonstration site here on the island where we operate this uh, electric road with a heavy duty truck for the town and a bus. Uh, and transferring energy from the road and in, uh, I mean, the real challenge is to remove or and really make the battery uh, size of vehicles much smaller and in that way uh, bringing electric vehicles uh, to the world in a larger scale. Uh, Bjorn, uh, if you could give us uh, a bit of a window into uh, the hydrogen technology that you are working with for transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, mainly, I'm I'm working with the uh, using hydrogen in the maritime sector, which is supposed to be a very hard to abate sector. Uh, I just came from a meeting this morning where we discussed now how to uh, how to manage the situation in the in the harbors with all the different new alternatives, uh, and I think that's a very good sign that we are now talking on very uh, hands on problems. Instead of talking about the vision, now we're talking about, hey, how much space do we need to have in the, in the port for this and this and that? And I think that is actually one really important thing that we, we must go from talking, we must go from theories to actually do some hands-on. Mm -hmm. And we have to do a lot of mistakes, of course, but we have to do those, those mistakes. And, and hydrogen is a very good opportunity for the maritime sector and for other sectors also, but for the maritime sector, which I work for, I see it. very good opportunities. We should be short now. Okay. Well, we spoke about the risk. Uh, you touched upon the opportunity, and perhaps, Shilpa, I can bring you in here. How do you see uh, solutioning, co-solutioning towards uh, climate action uh, and uh, sustainable solutions as an opportunity at PI? And perhaps we can get your mind very close as well. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Um, at PI, we see all these risks as an opportunity. It's an emerging market, you know, being an agrochemical industry, moving into the life sciences. We're exploring a lot of innovation and uh, some solutions. But I think the key part over here is any solution is a sustainable solution if you understood the real demand, deep dived into the problem, understood the problem so you can uh, uh, nail it in the bud only. And uh, also taking into the consideration that the safety management of coming up with the key solutions remains paramount for us. So yeah. um, looking into the, um, you know, the customer demands, looking to the quality aspects and the safety is something, you know, which we deep dive, understand and, you know, bring in to the uh, better solutions and uh, bring it together. Yeah, great to hear. And uh, we, a, a, a lot of you are uh, part of what we call the hard to abate industry. Per mentioned that, and uh, it is it's a difficult transition, no doubt. Um, 
Jakob, you have been with uh, ABB for a very long time, uh, falls under the heart to a bit industry. Now you are with uh, uh, an innovation that can uh, that can actually transform, uh, say, lives of smallhold farmers or food production. Of course, it is for smallhold farmers. But you've seen both the sides of uh, being a part of a, a, a young innovation company, uh, being with a gigantic, uh, well, multinational. Yep. Uh, how does the green transition really look like at a large scale versus uh, somebody who's, uh, you know, starting out or scaling up? Yeah, first of all, I just want to congratulate you, Ambassador, and uh, your whole team for the things you are doing between Sweden and India. Really impressive, this platform, of course, you, Rupali, for bringing us together. And Professor, thank you for, for hosting us here and PI, we all your team here. So. Uh, I have been with the industry for four years <coughs> at ABB, but prior to that, I worked with diplomacy for 25 years, uh, doing exactly what you have done, trying to bring platforms and working multilaterally. Uh, I was ambassador for sustainable business for almost uh, two years, bringing in the SDG goals. Uh, and after some times when you've been uh, where I've been, uh, it starts to itch. Uh, we talk about a lot of things that we should do and implement uh, and uh, after I left ABB, I talked to our chairman, Lars Tunnell, worked with IMF, had the same urge, we have to do, we have to implement. And up came this uh, proposal, why don't you join the board of a company called Spaudi? And I said, well, what is Spaudi? Well, it has potential to revolutionize the way farmers uh, do their business. He said business, he said farmers, he said revolutionize. And how? Solar power, uh, you know, bringing a very... I would say advanced technology that is so simple to use. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to see uh, is rather, you know, turning it around. Don't talk so much about the company. Talk about the customer, the farmer. One day they can go from having 100,000 rupees or something and tree up with one harvest. And they can do that if we just help out a little bit. So we need the collaboration. We need the implementation. And we need action. And it doesn't happen just by us being here. We have to be in the field. And that was my last little bit of, of decision why I joined Spaudi. This man here traveled all the regions in India. And now we are using India as an example with this date that we're having. Mm. And this can be a global platform for Africa. And uh, so I'm very excited about this. And uh, again, it, it won't happen like that. But now we have the solutions. and. Let's do it. And uh, we're, we're talking about, uh, you spoke about sort of creating uh, an ecosystem and that was mentioned earlier as well among the panelists. It is about uh, involving uh, academia, uh, involving industry, actually sitting down uh, as well as the government and making things happen. We've, we've talked about uh, wanting to make a change, but it's also about making things happen. And that's why, Per, you're in a very difficult job, of course, because... Uh, you you are trying to trying to include industry and trying to include uh, uh, government stakeholders to make that big shift. So I'll come to you in just a minute, but I'm going to uh, bring in Raine here. Raine, you're on the other side of academia. Uh, there's a lot of uh, innovation, papers, research that happens in academic environments. You've also been at the industry end, uh, especially of cement. Um, how does one mainstream uh, the innovation or the research that is happening in academic institutions and, uh, and, and start the conversation with industry, perhaps even start the conversations with those like uh, Lead IT who are bringing in government and industry already together for a great transition? Closer to the mic, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, and I will do a politician uh, thing, not really answering your question. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so I had 20 years in the industry and 20 years in academia, and I started in academia asking the question, why is it so difficult to improve? I'm still asking the question even of a higher level of confusion. But I think uh, if, we, if we go back to, to Uwe and Frodo, who wants to destroy that evil ring, he wants to do it, but he doesn't know really how to do it. That's how we are. We all want sustainable development. But in most cases, I postulate, not one of your organizations has a clear definition of what the sustainable development is for you. And that's the challenge. Mm. We need to go back to our own businesses and make that interpretation. 
what it is. It's going to be a working definition, but it is going to be something that helps us. And from sustainable building with Max Roswell, we've been thinking about what's sustainable building. And the other day I went down to one of the seminars that spoke about that. And I, I asked the question and they go, oh, well, climate, but there are many things. And then the cards were shuffled around and there wasn't any definition. So that I think is when we have looked at, at sustainability reports within building, there isn't a clear definition. So we have postulated one. We say sustainable building is at least affordable and carbon neutral because it addresses the two main things, especially for residential building then. It's a human right to have a dwelling and climate and the, uh, the, the building value chain is responsible for 40% of the carbon emissions. So we take those two things, we start with those. It's not all, but then we have a starting point. And that I think you need to do within PI industries, within, within SPAUDI, within food production, transport. What is the final solution? And then we can say, okay, we are halfway. So we can deal with sustainability like a level of performance. And then we need to see how do we change that level of performance. So I think that's a, a challenge for everybody. It is indeed a challenge, Rene. And uh, thanks for putting it out there. Uh, how do you define sustainability? How does each industry and how does each company really look at uh, what are what is sustainability at, at more at a concrete level as well for them? Um if 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 we are talking about uh, specific industries uh, we are also talking about uh, innovation that's important but how do you kind of measure that innovation and uh, if i can bring in uh, uh, Klaus here you've been working with with this with this technology in terms of uh, reducing the uh, co2 uh, uh, impact of buildings right um in terms of challenges and taking it to market and having, say, government and large industry buy-in. Uh, what are the challenges that you see as well as what is the opportunity that you see can work? Or what's that kickstart? As a, That's the word I heard Hendrik mention. What is it uh, for you as an innovator? Yeah, I, I do like Reine here as well to bring the microphone here. Uh, yeah, there are several uh, challenges, but also all challenges is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, one thing is demand, uh, and now we see, especially in the developed world, more and more demand for low C2 pro uh, products in, in, in construction. And I'm sure that this will grow more and more by Biden Act and all that in the US. And then, uh, so, so that's one thing. The, but one key thing is to, now we're talking about sustainability 4.0. And as Ryan is saying, we have to have a definition. I must say that we are working according to the framework for strategic sustainable development by a professor uh, that founded this uh, 25 years ago, where there are defined sustainability principles, mm -hmm. one social and four ecological. I don't take them here, but it's the framework is called FSSD. So, uh, so we are continuously working uh, with that. The other thing is when we're doing that, our partners in the value chain, because if we will manage to do this 4.0, we have to work in the value chains and work both on ecological sustainable and social sustainability. Mm -hmm. And we need that definition because we are in a postmodern world and what is true for me is not true for you. We cannot have it like that. Mm. We have passed the modernism. Now we are in postmodernism, but we have to have clear definitions. Otherwise, we can never solve this. So that's why I, I must urge that we have to go back to the base, talk about the same thing, and not be postmodern. Okay. And that's, this is how we're working in the value chains. Supply, you know, our raw material is not coming from the limestone directly under our ground. It's coming from the partners, mm. from the steel industry, from the aluminum industry, from, from other type of industries. And then we have to work and cooperate with them very clearly. Well, absolutely. And for, uh, for usual part, PI Industries, the value chain, and when we are talking about, uh, uh, well, if we, I, I don't want to get into technicalities of sort of scope one, scope two, scope three, but when we are talking about value chains, it is important that if we are going to truly make that transformation, uh, we need to be... Uh, sensitive to and aware of uh, how how sustainable is the value chain really, isn't it? Some thoughts on that? Uh, I think uh, it's a foremost uh, requirement, you know, starting from the onboarding 
identifying your needs you know whom do you want to partner with in that value chain and it comes with commitments of course you know there are multiple forms your declarations you take it but uh, what is required is that you know um, this entire uh, value chain actually leads to the most important part of your procurement strategies and uh, it does not end at your industrial consumption it ends at the end to end customers end mm. it also starts with your uh, you know as he said you know the raw materials are not coming from the grids you know i would just like to add to that is that your raw materials are also existing around you you need to come and be innovative how to reuse them so that you come up with a uh, sustainable product without uh, making it more expensive uh, sure. from the governance as well as of course monetary aspects sure and you speak of expensive uh, i'll also get in another element here that yeah. uh, a lot of innovators work with which is scale uh, how do you br- how do you when you are looking at newer technologies when we are looking at co solutioning uh, we're talking about scale and at the same time we're also talking about making the technology smaller and as efficient uh, as existing technology right so so yes. that there is an uptake and there is an adoption as well beyond if i can get you here uh one of the key challenges that we do look at and i think that is something which you can throw a light on is when we're talking about hydrogen we're also talking about how do you kind of package it to be uh more compact so that it can compete say with fossil fuel um yes i'm not really sure the question uh, so so if we, if we can if we can hear from you where are we in that journey uh, mm-hmm. of making hydrogen more compact uh, and uh, also so that it does get in a higher adoption well we have of course the problem with hydrogen that is a very small molecule mm-hmm. which means that we have on the one side it's very high energy content by per kilo but the volumes are very big uh those are physical propor- uh, things that we can't change actually we can of course compress we can compress the gas up to 1000 bars pressure which is very high uh still it will take quite some space and the more of course the more we compress the gas the higher the risks are also we we have to be aware of there are also of course possibilities that we use the hydrogen in combination with biogen co2 to create fluids like e-methanol we can we can uh, make uh, fuel for the aviation mm. we can use nitrogen to uh, to produce to produce uh, ammonia and so so uh, there will be hydrogen hydrogen will be used in different applications uh we can't we can't neglect that there are certain physical properties that we can't sure. change yeah. uh but it also it means also that we maybe we, we should change how we are behaving how we are used to do uh coming from the from the maritime business uh now if you go with fossil fuels you may be bunkering your your ship once every uh, second week or something like that mm. if we go by using hydrogen we need to bunker maybe every day and that's a change of behavior and we need to have technology to make that possible uh, okay so yeah yeah and and, and uh, i'll bring in hoken into that as well to answer that question uh uh it's a technology that yesterday we we uh, some of us got the ride at uh, at the smart road gotland bus and uh, you're trying out a uh, uh, a technology which uh, is 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 new is is uh it is going if if it does work uh and if you can scale it it can revolutionize the way uh, uh, that uh, uh energy is used for transportation but how does one make it competitive and how does one make it uh, easier to adopt for nations for uh for uh acro- across the world So I think we see this we we now have uh besides the demonstration here in Sweden we have demonstrations in uh Italy Germany uh Israel and the US uh and they just announced a new demonstration site in Norway uh and I think that's one of the main ways where how we move toward a large scale implementation we need to take it step by step we need to educate both ourselves but also our partners um what we do is uh, a true system of systems we we integrate inter- interact with the 
the grid uh, suppliers, with the road operators, with the vehicles, with the municipalities and the road, road operators. And it's, it's, a, it's kind of a complex, um, it's not something you sell off the shelf. <laughs> it's something that needs to be uh, addressed to, together. Sure. And uh, Per, if I can come to you uh, in terms of how are you addressing, uh, how are you bringing in government, industry, innovators, uh, maybe even academia together and solving that very large challenge of uh, the industry transition since you're, you're heading that secretariat. It is, it is, a, um, a, it's an initiative, uh, that was started uh, incubated at the UN and led by co-chaired by Sweden and India. Yes, that's correct. So I, I serve and report to the government of Sweden and India and we serve all our members. But I can't just get out of my head the Lord of the Rings story. If I remember correctly, the coalition that won in the end, there was a lot of inter-stakeholders conferences, there were a lot of battles between them, but in the end they created a common vision, a lot of innovation and magic, a lot of courage, a lot of first movers, a lot of doers, but they did win in the end. So that kind of, we have to understand how transformational the process is. Mm. Uh, it requires all sectors from a government perspective. It requires a whole of the government perspective, not just a single ministry or a single player. From industry, it requires probably a consortium of industries. We can just see here we are now, maybe the cement industry in Gotland or even the north of Sweden. It is not easy. So that inclusive process to create roadmaps and vision is probably quite important mm -hmm. to get everybody buy in. At the end of the day, to have a sustainable transition has to be just. It has to be globally just, it has to be locally just. So it involves social policies, municipality. So if we can somehow learn from what we do here on stakeholder engagement and share and, and try to, to teach each other and speak with each other as some of the... And that's, you know, uh, 18 member states of, of ours, they, they, they want to be frontrunners now. Mm. So the word frontrunner, which used to be with the risk, that has changed, I think. Mm -hmm. the, the environment has changed. Now, is what is a global level playing field in this segment when things are moving so fast mm -hmm. as it is today? Mm. I think so. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, and that is an encouraging note. And uh, uh, I've been told I have four minutes left on this discussion. Sorry, I had to, we had to cut it short. But uh, uh, last few words in terms of if we do uh, some amount of blue sky thinking, and I'd like to, I, I'd like to leave it with a positive note. So that's why uh, uh, I'm shooting this question to you. But if we do look at the scenario in, say, 2050, in in a sentence, how do you see the world which has been transitioned? Uh, we'll start there. Let's start that side. Bjorn. Um, there will be lots of changes until 2050, but I think if we're going to get those 2050 changes, we need to have targets on our way there because it's very easy to promise something that would happen within 25 plus years. Mm -hmm. Many of us will not be in the position of being responsible at that time. We might e not even be alive. So we need to have quite firm targets on the way there. And I think this is really the firm targets. And we don't need to go all the way, but we need to take step by step. And we need to make those promises. So roadmap, some firm targets, take it step by step. Hawken. 2050 seems yeah. a very far, a long time uh, to go. Uh, I would say just take uh, in December 2026, uh, the the largest uh, electric road in the world will, uh, will be starting operation in Sweden, according to the tra Swedish Transport Ad Administration, uh, and uh, I think that will be a huge stepping stone to to move forward. Fantastic, uh, Jakob. Yeah, very quickly. I, I mean, we heard some data today, 2050, we will have a need to produce 70% more food for the population. We will use 50% more water. Uh, One billion people will be added to the continent of Africa. They will be needing new roads. So let's not repeat the past. Uh, let's invest in that and uh, uh, set the targets. Uh, and I think when we have defined the problems, uh, uh, the models will be there. The economic models will be there. There's a lot of money out there. Uh, but maybe they are, you know, a little bit in the vault somewhere where Frodo can find it. If we can just unlock that money and uh, 
get the Balrog away and then we, yeah, the thing will stop here, we will actually move forward. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic, but it will take a bit of collaboration and uh, a little bit of guts and glory maybe also. Take a risk. Well, take the risk, uh, co co collaborate, co-solution. Uh, Shilpa. Yeah, I think um, now we are in the center of the issue. The issue is uh, how do we fix it, what we have given or given to ourselves at the moment. We've got solutions, we've got uh, new demands, and uh, there's going to be a possible conflict that when you come up with the new solutions, because you want to expand also, yet be governed, be sustainable in solutions, be innovative. So I think um, I would stick to this that, you know, deep dive into this before committing. Less is more is what you're actually going to win over for 2050 to 2070. Interesting. Less is more. Uh, and uh, Raine. <laughs> So uh, 2050, which is around, I think, is a world of democracy. So we need to see that uh, uh, Frodo and his coalition uh, are, are working together. <laughs> All right. Thank you, uh, Klaus. Yeah, on, on that theme, uh, you know, we're talking about technical solution and I'm, I'm representing, I work with hybrid for self field steel and cement, but I think for if we will solve this, you know, the philosophic leaders, the religious leaders will have to step up. And, and coming back to the Lord of the Rings, the, the scene where Pippin and his friend join the ants, you know, the shepherd of the forest. And, and the, the enemy is Saruman and, and what they're doing, actually. It's an allegory for, uh, for the modernist, the industrial world. And they are digging in Isengard, burning all the trees down, mining completely, leaving a dead, dead desert after. And, uh, but we are joining together with the nature and the ants and find a solution. So that is my vision for 2050. Yeah. All right, good to hear that. And uh, last words, Per, uh, your vision. The global vision between governments and industry in partnership, sharing risks and rewards. Fantastic. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, very interesting insights.